on behalf of him, uh, acknowledging the original custodians of the land on which we meet this evening, the Wolomitigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that welcome to any First Nations people who are here tonight, and note that this land was never ceded. So how it's going to work tonight is that uh, we'll have a chat, Carly and I'll have a chat for uh, half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up and you can have question time and have a chat. And uh, for those following us on Zoom, we'll get to you. So I'm sure if you get in the chat box at some point, we'll field those questions as well. But anyway, let's begin. At the beginning, Carly, how did you end up being the federal independent candidate for North Sydney? Oh, you know, I think, um, so one of the things to know about me right from the get-go is that I'm not a professional politician and nor did I actually um, envisage myself joining the political sphere for about the last 35 years. What I am, I would say, is a born campaigner. Um, I'm the eldest of four children born to very young parents out in northwest New South Wales, a town called Coonabarabran. And so I think from a really early age, what I learned was that if there was something that needed doing, some that was broken, that needed fixing, or some sort of in, um, injustice that needed to be addressed, then the quickest way to do that was to actually get up and fix it, you know, and, and be the solution to the problem. So um, for 35 years, I've worked around the edges of government um, at all levels. I've, you know, worked with local governments, state governments, federal governments, and then I found myself last year um, supporting my son while he was going through his HSA and I had a bit of space and I started to really look closely at the conversation that was being had at the federal level and I realised that I didn't feel like I was being represented in any way, shape or fashion. So I actually, sorry, I'd actually started... Um, yeah, okay, sorry. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Even I can hear that's better. <laughs> um, so, sorry, so backing up. So for the last 35 years, I've worked around the edges of government, whether that's local government, state government or federal government. I've been involved in the McGrath Foundation. I was the founding CEO there and built their breast care nurse program from three nurses to 100 in the space of six years. I advocated to get children out of immigration detention centres in 2014, and I've run businesses. But to answer your specific question, Lex, I literally was in my house supporting my son through his HSC and I got a phone call from a friend who had met somebody else, somewhere else, where a conversation had come up that there was a group of people in North Sydney mobilising to try and find someone who would run as the independent candidate for the federal seat of North Sydney. And I thought it sounded like a fascinating conversation. So I got ready to have a conversation with my friend to see how I could help. And um, she turned around and said, can I put your name forward? And I confess, I did laugh, just as a lot of people in this room have just done, because I think, um, as I said, I, I've had no, I'm not here because I think I have all the answers or I have any sense of grandiosity. You know, like, in fact, I was telling somebody earlier today, it would never in my wildest dreams have occurred to me to wake up one morning and go, I'm going to be a politician. It's just not how I was wired. But what has worked for me about this is that really I feel like while I'm the person who may be standing out the front because I've been invited to be the independent candidate, the reality is it's all of you guys and all of us that are actually standing up. And that's where I do my best work, whether it's breast care nurses, kids with cancer, running businesses, you know, getting kids out of immigration detention centres, that's where I do my best stuff. So did you say yes immediately or did you say I need time to think about this or like was it a light bulb moment? Did you think, yeah, actually that's what I want to do? 
But so um, one of the, my dad's a mechanic. And um, so what was really interesting for me is you guys need to know the people involved in this movement in the background put me through the absolute ringers. <laughs> so it was a process of about eight weeks of meetings with different people, conversations with different people. And in fact, it got to the point on one particular Friday um, the, the crew had requested another meeting with me and um, I literally, I think I said to them at the start of the call, I now know what an automobile feels like when it's put up over the pit because I feel like you have seen every part of me. Um, but they surprised me by on that day saying, asking if I would run as the independent candidate. And I think I surprised myself even more by immediately saying yes. Um, the crew did say, you know, we appreciate this is a big ask. Do you want to take the weekend to think about it and come back to us on the other side of the weekend? But I just didn't need that time. You know, I, I, by that stage, eight weeks in, I think I was even more convinced about the fact that there was a really important conversation that wasn't being had at our federal government level. And I felt the responsibility to be part of the process of stepping up and helping that conversation to get traction. So yeah, I did say yes, straight away. And um, what in, in particular were the reasons that you were so sure that that's what you wanted to do? It was a real moment for me in would have been 2019, September 2019, where I knew there was a conversation going on in the state of New South Wales about whether or not a new gas power plant would be built in the Hunter Valley region. Now, the town I grew up in, Coonabarabran, is northwest New South Wales, so it's the edge of the Hunter Valley. And I had a moment where actually I was really proud that the New South Wales government came out and said, no, we don't need it. You know, we, we know we, energy security is fine. Um, we don't believe we're heading in that direction. We've set ourselves ambitious carbon emissions reductions. We don't want a gas power plant. And then to my absolute befuddlement, the Prime Minister came out and said, well, even if you don't want it, we're going to build it. So you may not want it, but we're going to put a gas power plant into the Hunter Valley. And it just struck me as being wrong on so many levels. So as somebody who had always um, had an awareness about what was happening in our climate, in terms of our environment, I mean, you don't, you don't grow up west of the mountains and not understand how devastating these continuous droughts, then the flooding rains and the bushfires have been on those communities. So it really... I've done those drives where you drive through paddock fences and there are just animals dying or dead on the side of the road. And so I'd always had this very strong environmental climate mind. And in that moment, as I heard the Prime Minister say, well, you're going to get it, whether you want it or not, my business brain clicked on. I mean, now this is just bad business. Not only is this now bad choices when it comes to the science behind the environment, you're now taking my money, our money, and investing it in a project that is going to be a white elephant. There is no way that asset can um, capitalise itself over time. It will be left stranded. Um, there is no evidence to suggest we need it. And yet there seems to be this bloody mindedness that it's going to go ahead, whether we want it or not. So that, that was definitely a, a real turning point for me. I think the other thing was um, for the last 18 months, I've been working with young Australians in particular. So two groups, vulnerable young Australians that would otherwise fall through the cracks. So kids who maybe have violence happening at home or they may have a parent who's in the criminal system. They may have come in contact with the criminal system themselves with a, an organisation called Youth In Search. They do amazing work. And then with another lady called Amanda Riedel, who had lost her son Harrison to suicide when he was 13 years old. And Amanda is developing an app to support young people when they're in crisis. And so I've been working this area for 18 months to work out what it was that we could do to offer great, greater support to young Australians. And these organisations are doing incredible things. And I had this moment where I realised it didn't matter how hard we work in that area and how incredible those programs are if fundamentally we can't say that we're living in a safe 
environment and in a safe community. So it kind of was the combination of the two things where it was the realisation that what the, the party, <laughs> and I, I will own this, you know, I, I raised, I was brought up to believe that the Liberal Party was good for business. They made good business decisions. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden what I saw was this mechanism, which I thought was meant to be geared that way, making bad business decisions as well as bad environmental decisions. And it was just the perfect, perfect storm where I started looking closer at what was going on and realised I just couldn't see how a two-party system was serving our country to move us to a better place. Is there a contradiction there or, or a conflict there? There's a business background. Is that compatible with a social justice orientation? I like to think so because I exist and I see a lot of people sitting in this room tonight who I think are wired the same way. But I think maybe the maybe the question that I would be inclined to ask ourselves is does a business background with a social bend match with what we currently have as a political offering in this country? And I think that's where the tension is. You know, when you look, so let's be honest, when the Australian constitution was written, there was no such thing as political parties, right? So the constitution was created as a tool to enable a multitude of communities across this continent to come to a central location and have robust discussions around the things that mattered to the country to move the country forward. The people who went to that house went to represent the communities that sent them. Somewhere along the line in the last hundred years, parties came in, the process started to change. And where I think we are today is with the political system where we have, don't get me wrong, I, I have no doubt the people that have chosen to go into politics are trying to do good by their communities, but they are stuck in a flawed system because the bottom line is a community sends them to Canberra to advocate for them. But once they walk in those doors, if they're part of a, a party, their first alliance is to the party. So regardless of the agenda that their community has sent them on, if it is the case that the bulk of the party opinion is against that ambition, they will be voted down. And then in the case of the major parties, if you're part of the Liberal or the Labor Party, you walk out of that caucus room to show up in the house to go in and cast your vote, and you're just given a piece of paper and told where your vote's going to go. So I think there's been this real... Um, it's, I think it's an, it does a disservice to our community in terms of how it's evolved. Having said that, I take 100% responsibility for that because I've been a voter for the last 35 years. So the power in that is recognising that if we've created it, we can recreate it. Um, but it's not going to be easy because nobody likes change. And particularly once you're in a position of power, nobody likes to be told it may be able to be done differently. You mentioned climate change as being uh, the moment that really crystallised things for you. What other issues then came along that backed that up that you thought, not necessarily complementary issues, but you thought, hey, there's another thing that I don't feel as though I'm being represented fully on. What else can I change if I, if I get there? De um, definitely something that just can completely blows my mind is the way that business is done in um, the, at the federal level of politics. And I think th that's as it relates to transparency, accountability, the treatment of working peers, the workplace that is Parliament House. Um, I was absolutely floored to know there is no parliamentary code of conduct. Now, can someone, anyone in this room, put up your hand if you've worked in a work environment that has said to you, we don't have any expectations about how you're going to behave while you're here? Anybody? No. Yet, perhaps the, one of the most important work environments in our country, that being our central federal seat for leadership, has no code of conduct.
There is a ministerial code of conduct, but I would think that we could all agree that in the last three years, it's been proven that that's about as useful as the excess toilet paper we now have on our shelves without the COVID rush. So I, I, to me, the way business is done and the lack of integrity at federal the federal political level is a real issue for us. Um, and again, I think we need to own that. You know, we've let that happen and, and um, I, it's not lost on me that this morning, you know, news broke that our Prime Minister wangled his party into a room last night and told them they must pass the religious discrimination bills today because they were promised. So that was his argument to his party room. <laughs> And actually, if I'd had a direct phone to him, all I wanted to say is, but what about everything else that was promised? What elevates this above a Federal Integrity Commission? Which, because for me, I actually think, you know what? If integrity went from being just a bold, audacious idea to actually being a verb in Canberra, imagine how different our politics would look. And, you know, I guess it was my business brain. I just, I can't accept that we employ these people. Okay, the government works for us. Well, I reckon it's time we gave them a performance report <laughs> because it, they're just not listening and there's no, no consequences. That then rolls to the treatment of women in politics. And um, women are 51% of this community. Australia is the number one country in the world for educating women. Um, if you look at universities, for every 100 women at university, there are 74 men. So we are killing it when it comes to educating. Yet when you look at the World Economic Forum and our performance on gender gap, we dropped 35 places in the last six years, down to number 50. So we're barely in the top one third anymore. And we've dropped down to 70th place in terms of female participation in the workforce. Now, there's something systemically wrong in that equation. And to me, it is reflected at our highest level of government. Um, we do not have a broad enough base of representation in Canberra. And, you know, I had one of my first bosses um, when I was running the Edelman business here in Australia. He was based in Singapore. And we were on a phone one night about numbers and I was making an argument about my staff. And he said, geez, Tink. He said, you're like a pineapple in my armpit. And I was like, a what? And he said, you're a pineapple in my armpit. I'm like, what does that even mean? He said, well, you're really sweet. And, you know, I want to be around you. But if you put me in my armpit, you're really annoying. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's what we can do with federal politics. You know, it's time the pineapple went in the armpit for federal politics. <laughs> Just, um, I'm still, I've still got the video running of the um, pineapple in your armpit at the moment, and I'll deal with that later. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing pineapple t-shirts popping up <laughs> everywhere as of tomorrow. Um, you, you talk about just on the subject of gender for the moment, you are uh, entering, not, a, not only or aspiring to enter a place where not only is there a very lax code of conduct, but there's actual hostility towards women. It's not a safe environment. Are you prepared for that? I'm a woman of a certain age who's <laughs> worked in business for a really long time in environments where more often than not, I've potentially been the only woman in the room. So um, I feel like my honest answer to that is I'm only human, okay? And um, does it frighten me to think about stepping into that environment? I think you would have to say I was crazy if I didn't say yes. I'm a little bit um, scared by what that might mean. But the really interesting thing about me, and I'm sure about a lot of other people that are here tonight, um, just because it's scary doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And in fact, I think the fact that I 
or any woman should feel afraid to consider taking a role at the level of our national government is an absolute disgrace and disservice to our country. And I do not want any woman who is younger than me or even older than me who aspires to have that ambition to not go for it because she doesn't feel safe to do so. So um, I'm not crazy. I don't expect it's going to be easy. But what I do know is that unless we do start turning up and walking in, it's never going to change. This is not a door that's being thrown open. So we need to put our foot in and then wedge it more and more and more for everybody else. Have you had any, uh, has there been any reaching out from, uh, female politicians, female politicians of either parties, major parties, or independents? Have, have, you, have you sought any advice or have they offered any advice and support? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, what's really interesting about this movement is I do believe this is a this is a point in time and I think it's a point in time for both our society but also my generation um, have I had any contact from people in the parties no <laughs> surprisingly can you believe that people are in a party don't want to mentor an independent I've actually asked I've asked a number of people if they would give me some advice but they've not been interested um, I am incredibly fortunate that I'm not the first female independent. So Kathy McGowan, um, who I actually didn't know until I'd already been found by North Sydney's independent and asked to run, connected with me very quickly after I was identified. And um, she is an incredibly smart, courageous and gracious woman. And I think having her there as a sounding board for me has been really important. I also want to do a massive shout out to Zali Stegel. Um, Zali has been in incredibly engaging and supportive of me. And I think what's really interesting and, and what I find fascinating about this movement is that they're not doing it because there's something in it for them. <laughs> you know, they're truly doing it because um, like me, they know and believe in the power of a strong independent crossbench in terms of driving a different conversation at the federal level. So they would be the two people I would particularly call out as, as having helped. And yeah, there's been other conversations I would say. I won't name her because I one day I might. I might release a book and it'll be my big tell. But there's somebody who's quite senior in one of the parties a female in politics and when we were discussing what I was doing she got quite animated and her comment to me was Kylie you don't understand it's taken a hundred years for us to get this system to work this way and we're really happy with how it's working the one thing it can't cope with is people like you <laughs> And I was and inside, I think she was trying to say it as a way of sit down, get out of the way, it's working, you know, it doesn't need fixing. Whereas the minute those words left her mouth, I was like, I am where I am meant to be. This is what we're meant to be doing. You've been on the, uh, on the trail for a few months now. What have you learned? Oh. oh gosh, I wish you'd met Kylie in September, guys. <laughs> um, what have I learned? What I've learned is that once you see something, you can't unsee it. And the reality is that the most magnificent amount of power exists for every single voter in Australia in recognising that the current system that we're living in is of our creation. So when we get to those voting booths, everybody's vote is equal. So my 19-year-old son's vote is just as important as Scott Morrison's vote. And my main observation of us as a society and I think where we are today is there is just such extraordinary potential in us waking up and actually deciding what we want to be as a country. How do we want to turn up? 
How do we want the people that are presenting us to turn up? What do we want our international peers thinking of us? What's the legacy we want to leave and the role we want to play? globally and the reality is that is within all of our power it just requires us to be mindful and conscious of how our how we vote and vote deliberately use your voice use your vote um i think what was really hard initially is there's a lot, a lot of people that are completely disengaged from politics because they've lost faith you know, I would talk to people initially and they'd be like, what are you doing? I literally had friends who tried to do the intervention and sit down with me and go, what are you doing? Um, and I actually, it's so dorky because I'm not a political geek, but man, I just get excited by the potential of this nation of ours actually standing up and saying, we're done trusting and leaving this in the hands of others, we are taking politics back. Politics is for the people, it's not for the parties. And I just, I fundamentally believe if we had a stronger voice from the community in that house at the moment, we would have faster action on climate. We would have a federal integrity commission. We would have equality playing out. Um, we would have asylum seekers, you know, that are not being held in indefinite detention, things that just are not true representations of us. I don't think they'd be allowed to proceed and to continue. But as it currently sits, because the system ain't broke and they're really happy with how it's running, there's no incentive or drive to be that really positive force of change. I'm probably a romantic. I'm an incredibly, I am a proud Australian. You know, I um, think about our nation and I am filled with optimism. And, but I, we are a nation that is 60,000 years old and we need to step in to that. And I think this is a real opportunity for us to mature and kind of say, this is the country we want to be into the future. Yeah. Uh, what are you noticing about the support you're getting? Is it is there a groundswell? Are you getting enough support? Are you, are you surprised by the support you are getting? Or do you have in your own mind uh, an image of someone you think is a, a Kali voter only to be surprised that it's someone else? So I, I know without a shadow of a doubt that this for, for this movement to be successful for North Sydney, it is absolutely one conversation at a time. Um, I don't take anything for granted. And I think what I am really just so grateful for is the number of people who are prepared to actually talk to me about what they think and what they're worried about. So is there a typical Tink supporter? Um, I think not yet would be my, my response to that because I can actually say I've gone to events in the last three months where there have been people at the start of an event that will go, and they're really lovely. People, people are generally pretty lovely to me, but they'll say as I walk in, well, I'm a blah voter. You know, I've been a Greens voter all my life or a Labor voter all my life or a Liberal voter all my life. You know, I, I'm, it's lovely to meet you. Thanks for doing what you're doing. But, but by the end of the night, they're actually going, you know what? You make a lot of sense. Actually, you know what? I didn't expect it, but you are going to get my vote. I will give you number one, and then I'll give my habitual vote number two. And I think that that's – so, yeah, there's, there's not a typical – and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody in this room, but I've got to tell you, the one group I really wish could vote – is the five to 10 year olds because I've had two experiences like recently. I was walking down the main street of Northbridge and these two little girls came up to me. It was the big sister and the little sister and they just stood in front of me and I kind of clocked that I may have seen them before. And I talked to anybody. My grandmother would have told you I can talk under wet cement. And I said to them, oh, hi, guys, I'm Kylie. <laughs> and this, the elder of the two said to me, no, no, we know who you are. And I said, oh, okay. I said, it's really lovely to meet you. They said, yeah, yeah, we're voting for you. <laughs> and I said, oh, are you? They said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're voting for you. And I was like, well, you might have to go home and talk to the grown-ups about that. <laughs> 
But then in a similar vein, only two weeks ago, I was on a community Zoom and a gorgeous young mum came into the Zoom late, didn't realise I was on the Zoom and she kind of clocked me and she went, oh God, she said, Kylie, is that you? I said, yeah. She said, oh, I was rushing out the door and my five-year-old said to me, mum, where are you going? And I turned around and said, um, I'm going to meet with a group of people that are, are going to save the world. That's what they're going to do. And her five-year-old turned around and said, Mum, are you going to go meet with Team Tink? <laughs> and I was like, so I kind of figure if, you know, I was always taught as a communications professional that you have to target your message to somewhere between five and nine-year-olds. So hopefully the message is, going, is getting through. But Lex, it's going to be tough. Like it's not, and I think it is really important for me to reassure you guys, I'm not, it is one conversation at a time. I will fight for every single vote, but not because I think I've got all the answers or I have some sense of grandeur. It's because I think your opinion matters and it deserves to be heard in the Federal House of Representatives, not just in some party room. Look, just, just following on from the, the final one before we open it up for questions, uh, is there any specific demographic that you think is disengaged and needs to be brought back to the political process? Um, I think, so having worked with youth for the last 18 months, I've got to say there was a period of time when I first said yes to doing this, that I was motivated to do it for them because I really feel like, and it's to my shame, I felt that I would talk to some of those young people and it was almost like they were just waiting for us to die and get out of the way because we are not acting in a way which is respectful of their future and the future we're leaving for them. So I actually think the rising of first-time voters, like 18, 19, 20, 21, 22-year-olds, they are a formidable force if they decide to influence the outcome of this election. At the same time, I would say that people over sort of 60 going up, they're also the ones that are kind of turning around going, we are not going to leave this in this state for our kids, for our grandkids, this has to be addressed. So it is really interesting to me, it's kind of the opposite ends of the age um, range are the ones that are actually starting to roar. And I think for us in the middle, what it means is that we're getting this real reverberation, which is asking us to actually consider, well, where do I stand in this now? You know, I, I don't have the time to just trust that somebody is going to fix this. How am I going to vote next time to actually get the action on faster action on climate because it's good for our environment and it's good for our economy? The establishment of an integrity commission, it is not hard that legislation is there and waiting to be passed. Equality, gender equality, recognition of First Nations, better treatment of asylum seekers, and an economy that we can embrace and know is having a positive impact on the world. Um, we've got to stop digging stuff out of the ground and shipping it overseas when we are just as capable of actually really leading the charge for a sustainable and a renewable energy globe. Cool. Okay, over to you. If there's um, any question you'd like to ask, I guess put your hand up and uh, we Good to roam with the mic. We're not going to get feedback. You have a question? Yeah. Sure. I will. Uh, thank you, Carly. Barry Buffy is my name. Um, I should declare that I'm a locked in pink voter already because of your passion for the environment and holding governments to account and equality for women. The thing that makes me ashamed to be an Australian is our treatment of refugees. And the fact that we hold people in prison or in detention for nine years when they're officially refugees, yeah, a greater sentence than many rapists get is just something that makes me ashamed to be an Australian. So what's your position on that, please? 
Um, so I think what's really interesting about asylum, um, the treatment of asylum seekers here in Australia is that actually, amazingly, this is something where both of the major parties are equally culpable. Yeah. You know, this, this mandatory detention was brought in under Paul Keating originally, offshore processing under Julia Gillard. Um, you know, Kevin Rudd was the one who came out and said anyone who arrived by boat would never be able to call themselves an Australian. We've then seen Morrison play the role that he's played and he was actually the one that I took on in 2014. So in 2014, after I'd finished up at the McGrath Foundation, I was having a bit of a break and um, my name got mentioned at a barbecue. I don't know what it is about my friends like to offer my name around to people, obviously, but my name got mentioned at a barbecue and I got approached by a group of people who were determined to get children out of immigration detention centres. At the time, there were 750 kids under the age of 15 who were being detained by the Australian government under conditions where things like if they'd shown up with their glasses, their glasses were taken from them because it was considered a potential threat. They weren't allowed access to their medications because it was considered a potential threat. Um, three times a night, a torch would be shined in their face to check that they were who they said they were, their ID would be checked. And so I got involved with that group of people at that time and we launched a campaign called We're Better Than This Australia. And we set to work corralling a massive diverse group of people. And we did, we had captains of industry, the Carnegie's came on board. We had um, high profile celebrities, Brian Brown, Deborah Mailman, George Gregan. We had the um, head of the UNHCR came on board. It was a massive alliance of people. And we pushed to get those kids out of the immigration detention centers. We got them out. We wanted them out by Christmas. We didn't get them out till January. But at the time, the thing that hurt, and it still hurts me today, is they were released on what's called a temporary protection visa. Um, it was the first time really those visas had been executed on a, a mass scale in Australia. And at the time, the group that I was working with, we kind of reconciled ourselves. And I still remember Gillian from um, UNH at MCR said to me, you know, Kylie, at least we got them out of the burning house. So it's like the kids are in the burning house, we've got it out, got them out. Now we can work out what to do with them. Um, eight years on, no one's worked out what to do with them. So we have people who have grown up in this country, have been educated here, are holding jobs down here, yet they cannot get a mortgage because they have no further guarantee of residency that goes beyond a three or a five year window. We have the case of the Billawilla family. Um, who in this room doesn't believe that the two girls that were born in Australia are Australians? They are. And yet our government at this stage is telling the youngest one of those girls she cannot stay, that she's not Australian. They're not going to recognise her. So, you know, to me, this is where I think, and this is why I think the system needs disrupting because this is bloody mindedness and it's not befitting of who we are as a nation. There are 30,000 people currently on TPVs in Australia. Imagine the potential that we unlock by actually saying to them, you are now here you are Australian, we welcome you. It's not going to kill us. 30,000 is not a big number. Um, so I actually think this is one area where, again, I think a strong crossbench can actually raise that conversation with both of the major parties and say it's time to move on, particularly because we do know, and we've got to get this right really, really quickly, with everything that's going on with climate and environmental impact, we are going to see mass migration of refugees across our globe in the next five to 10 years. What are we going to do as a nation? Are we seriously saying we are not letting anybody in? And I think that that's, we have to have the conversation as a community to decide what we think is the right thing to do. I have to preface that by saying I do not believe that it's open borders, everybody coming in. That's not what I'm suggesting. 
But what I am advocating really strongly for is that our processes and systems need to change so that if people show up here, we deal with them fairly and quickly. So even the UK, they have about, it's I think it's usually max about a five-day turnaround. If you show up illegally in the UK, you either get to stay or you're sent home within five days. The average length of time, anybody got any guess of what the average length of detention here in Australia is at the moment? 73 years. <laughs> It's actually, so 500 days is the average, 500 days with no legal recourse, no representation, you are held indefinitely. And, um, and to your point, Barry, you know, of this 30 odd men being held in Melbourne at the moment, all of them have been deemed to be true refugees. They are true refugees, and yet eight years on, we're still detaining them. And, you know, think about what sort of blow up there was for us when we were told if you came back from overseas, you had to have two weeks in quarantine in a hotel room. These boys were 15 because they didn't meet the criteria when I was advocating. They were classified as adults, so we lost them to the system, and they're still in the system. Any more questions? Questions anywhere? Yeah. Yeah, I know I'll get you the microphone. Yes, sorry, yes. I know where you'll be taking me with this question, and I'm very sympathetic. I want to understand um, how you talk to this issue of Trent Zimmerman, a moderate within the party, working within the party for change, but not being effective is my view, um, and making the comparison with how we should vote for you, whereas if we vote for you and we lose Trent, we lose that voice in the party. Can you talk to that for us? Yeah, um, so I want to say I've met Trent. Chris. Chris, thank you. Um, I've met Trent a number of times. And in fact, it was one of the first things that North Sydney's Independent asked me when they first reached out to me. You know, they're like, what do you think of Trent? And I said, look, he's a real, he's a nice guy, but completely ineffective. Um, in some ways, I actually feel a little bit sorry for him because the place where I struggle is if the things that he talks to us about being passionate about, if they are truly innate to him, like they're the things he believes passionately. Imagine it, how it must feel to be him and six years on to not have moved the dial even a, even a quarter of a centimetre. Um, and so actually what I want to do in that case is actually call it out and say I think the Liberal National Party thinks that we're idiots and I think they think that moderates are a shield. So as long as they can say they've got moderates in the party, they can do whatever they want. Um, and so, you know, I'm not into party politics and somebody said to me the other day, so about the Liberal Party, I said, the Liberal Party is not my responsibility. I really do not care about the Liberal Party. And I'm sorry, this may offend, I really do not care about the Labor Party. <laughs> what I care about is our community and whether or not we're getting fair and adequate representation. And quite frankly, I feel I'm really, I am angry. I'm angry that we chose someone, I chose someone, so I, I bought the moderate line at the last election. I chose that person thinking we'd get movement and nothing's happened. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again in exactly the same way and expecting a different outcome. I'm done. I'm not buying what they're selling anymore. And um, I think that that's, you know, th that's the potential for us as a community. Because you're right, Chris, I think regardless of where we lie, for 100 years, North Sydney has basically been a Liberal seat. Um, of all the independents that are running, I'm running against one of the highest margins. So Trent has a pretty decent margin over the top of me. Um, but I think the problem is that we're just being sold down the creek and our voice is not heard and it's not making a difference the way it's being presented at the moment. So let's try and deliver it in a different way. Uh, my name's Judy and thank you very much. It's really nice to get to hear more about you. Um, 
So um, two questions. One is, um, you know, hopefully you get elected, and but if there's a hung parliament, how would you, uh, you sort of decide, you know, where you're going to go? And the second question I'm interested in is, what's your take on the religious discrimination bill? I love these double barrel questions. <laughs> Um, so to the first one, I think what's really important about this movement for us as a community, if this is what we're going to do and this is the result we want, we need to be clear about where it is that we want action, you know, and what are the things that we want to see. So part of things like tonight, the reason these are really important to me is I need to listen to you guys about what are the things you want to see me advocating for, where are our policies actually going to end up. So I've, we've given a large frame, faster action on climate, establishment of an integrity commission, equality, a forward facing economy. So we've got these big umbrellas. The job that my amazing team of volunteers are currently doing is we're chunking that down into what do those things actually look like? What are we going to be advocating for? Um, the elections are really long way off still technically speaking, in terms of political terms, <laughs> who knows what this Prime Minister might do. Um, so we don't know which way it's going to end yet, and the decision is very much in the hands of Australians. What I'm asking is that the seat of North Sydney give me the number one vote so I can go down there and make sure we're heard. If I'm in a position where I'm then asked to be part of a process of deciding who leads, that will be all about being very clear about what it is I've been sent down there to do and then having those conversations with the parties involved to get us over the line. She's going to kill me for saying this, but I actually had a laugh with Zali the other day because she said someone had spoken to her about somebody being the kingmaker. And my response to her was actually, why can't we be the queen makers? You know, why, why can't we reshape politics? Why does it have to be this way? So, you know, honestly, I would love to see 22 independents in the House because I think we would be having very different political conversations if we got them in. So, you know, I think it's really important we don't get snowballed and conned by the language that is independence can't do anything. Because if you look at the last three years in politics, the last six years, the most significant legislative changes have been advocated for by independence. Um, Zali Stegall's climate bills, Helen Haynes' integrity bills, Andrew Wilkie's gambling responsibility bills. Independence gets stuff done. And what we need is enough of them en masse to actually make the parties come to the table. Um, then the second question was the religious discrimination bill. <laughs> we, the government came to power three years ago and made a number of promises to our community about things that they were going to prioritise. The bill in its form, I believe, is a direct response to the fact that as a nation, our voices were finally heard and we recognised the importance of same-sex couples. I think the immediate rebound then was the creation of this religious discrimination bill. And I think the thing that really concerns me on a couple of levels, when they ran the parliamentary committee prior to the legislation even being drafted, the committee came back and said, there is no need for this legislation. There is no problem. There is no problem here to be fixed, move on. But because there'd been a political promise, legislation still got drafted. Now we're in a place where we have legislation being debated. I don't know if the decisions come through. I'd need somebody to check that for me. But it's being debated today. And on the basis of that legislation, if you're a teenager, if you're a teenage girl in an all-girls school who actually is, you know, a boy trapped in a girl's body, you can be expelled. That's not okay. You know, it's not making us. And I think this is the thing. I, the potential of federal government, I believe, is to lead us to a better place. It's to have the longer term vision and say we can be better than who we are. That legislation to me makes us smaller. And um, I think ultimately, if I can be indulged just one more minute on a soapbox, we don't have a human rights bill in Australia. 
I don't know if you guys know that. There's no Human Rights Act. We are the only Western nation that does not have a Human Rights Bill. So the, our human rights legislation here at the moment is this very awkward layer upon layer upon layer of legislation where basically every time somebody finds a problem or a loophole, another piece of legislation is created to pile over the top of it. Um, I think that's another would be a really exciting conversation for us to have in the next six years is what does a Human Rights Act look like in Australia and how does it establish because why should one right be more important than another? Anyone out there? Any questions over here? What's your name? Uh, my name's Nina Ardil. Um, speaking of kids in school and equality, just wondering what your position on funding of government versus non-government schools is, particularly might be a little bit controversial in an area like this. <laughs> so could you speak a little bit to that, please? Um, look, education is a basic, I think it's a basic human right. And we know that the earlier we get access to quality education for our kids, the better outcomes we get. Um, I think we need to invest more heavily in public education across our lower North Shore area. That's with no disrespect meant to, to the amazing private schools we have because my son went to Joey's until 12 months ago and my daughters go to Loretto Kirribilli and I think those schools are great. I love that they're there. But I went to Coonabarabran infant school, primary school, high school, and I had a bloody good education. And I think um, to a certain extent, my kids ended up in the schools that they were at because I didn't feel like I had a public high school that I could have sent them to. So I do think we need to ensure that we have the right educational processes in place from an appropriate age. And actually, it's a nice segue. I hope you don't mind me stealing this, Nina. But I'm actually also a really big advocate in, and I believe it's important, we need to address um, early childhood education and care. Um, so I'm talking about, you know, kids that are over 12 months old, where are they going? What sort of facilities do we have here on the Lower North Shore? Did you know that childcare here on the Lower North Shore is some of the most expensive in the country? So, you know, how do we make sure that we're building a system that is actually there from the point that the kids need it, not just mum and dad, but is actually there for them from that point in time? So it's a, it's a whole of system challenge, I think, Nina. And vocational education? Look, I'm of the era where a TAFE qualification was one of the most important things you could get to send you on your way to life. So um, I do think that it's really important that we're providing um, easy pathways for young Australians to get to the careers that they want to get to. I do. I disagree with the recent shift in strategy to make the study of humanities and arts more expensive. Again, I think that dumbs down our community. I think it's a disservice to our community. Um, but again, I think we need to stand up and be counted and say this is what we want to see in terms of secondary and tertiary education for our kids. And it needs to be fair because the quicker we get them qualified, the quicker we get them out there and working, I hate to say it, but the quicker they're paying tax. Yeah. So the more we can do with all these other projects that we want to get on with. Any more questions, please? Right. Well on Zoom. This is from Claudia Stevens, who's watching on um, on Zoom. Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins both spoke at the National Press Club today about the need for action rather than words when it come when it comes to sexual abuse. Can you talk about the Jenkins report and whether you support the implementation of all its recommendations? And what do you think of Grace Tame's call for investing in preventative education? Um, another double barrel question. So I didn't, I, I confess, I didn't get to hear the um, speech today. I have my incredible team had me in back to backs from, from very early on this morning, but I'm looking forward to listening to it. 
So what I would say, the Kate Jenkins, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's piece of work, those 52 recommendations are gold and they have been handed over to us and dropped in the lap of our government. To date, um, the government has adopted barely a handful of them. I think it's six that they've um, agreed to proceed with. So I'm a very, very big fan of not reinventing the wheel. When the work's been done, I think we need to face into the work, embrace it and get on with it. I tend to be of the same ilk as um, Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame in that I was quite cynical about the apologies that were offered yesterday. Um, I know that all good recompense starts with an apology, but I think the key word in my sentence is starts. You have to have a plan for where you go from there. And Kate Jenkins has given us a really good starting, starting point there. And then the second part of the question train was, yeah, preventative education, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, I've said, I don't know whether I've said this, I'm a mum of three kids. So I have a 19-year-old son, a 17-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old daughter. And actually, I'm as afraid for my son as I am for my daughter. <laughs> I think there's this quite a... Um, volatile conversation going on in our community at the moment about um, rights and how we approach each other. And my concern, and I guess my ambition, is that what our kids should be learning is that we're just human, you know, whether you're male, female, LGBTQI, you know, like this is the discussions we need to be having is about how we meet in a common place. And um, I'm all for education as long as it's applied fairly across the entire system, because again, I think this is an entire system um, response. One more question. Certainly. What's your name? Thank you. Yeah, um, Bridget Dowsett. Um, climate change, and thanks, Kylie. Everything you've said tonight is terrific. We, I'm sure we're all very pleased to hear about the massive range of issues that you've covered. But I'd just like to come back to the environment. Climate change is the massive one, of course, we all understand. <clears throat> but there's so much more that the federal government has to do. And I just would love to hear from you what you will do, how are we going to manage the Murray Darling Basin, how are we going to stop land clearing, how are we going to deal with the, the, with the, with the species extinction, the crisis that we have there. You know, there are so many huge issues that unfortunately have been completely neglected in the last few years. And if we can see some more action on that, that would be fantastic. So all power to you. <laughs> That was definitely a double barrel question. <laughs> and I think that's another whole session. Other than to say, I think the answer I can give you is we have to start, you know, at the very least, we, we only need three more, three to four more sensible um, people on the independent crossbench. And we have got a game changer when it comes to the conversations that have to be had. And um, that's what excites me because, you know, at that point, I think we can really start to call to account. We need a plan. We don't, net zero by 2050 is such a furphy. And I really hope anyone in this room do not accept it. That is 10 elections away. The people who have offered us that, I don't know where they're going to be by 2050. But what matters to us as a community is what's going to happen by 2025, what's going to happen by 2028, what's going to happen by 2032. We need to be laying this down, setting ourselves goals and kicking them and doing it together as a community. This is not a transition we can turn on and off overnight. There are communities we need to work with to help them move along. And we need to all be in the same boat for that to happen. And, you know, that will take community consultation and, and building. But at the moment, we're not even having the conversation. We're just too busy digging. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up, do we? One more, one more. Oh, okay, down this side. Three more. Three more. Uh, 
Given the double barrel questions, that's about another eight. <laughs> Two two questions. Sorry, I do have two questions. They're not double barrel, it's two. Helen Lange. And um, the first question is your preference policy, one. And the second one is more to do with a little uh, more clarification on the question you answered before. Given your background of voting in the past, if there was a hung parliament, would you be able to side with the, with the Labour Party? or would you just go with the way you've always voted in the past? I'm gonna answer the first, second question first. And it's very clearly, no, I wouldn't just go with the way that I've always voted in the past. I'm very clear, we need action on the policy areas that are being relayed to me are the most important to our electorate. So we need to be able to work with a government that can meet us in a space that is economically responsible, but is progressive on the areas that we want to see movement on. So um, I did say to someone earlier today that, I, and the question gets asked 10 times a day, what will you do in the case of a hung parliament? What will you do in the case of a hung parliament? And I just from nowhere, I kind of got this idea. It's kind of like asking me, what am I going to feed the winner of the next Melbourne Cup? Like until the race is run, I don't know where we're going to end up. You know, we, there might be a clear majority government in the next parliament, in which case we will work within the format that that offers us to get the best outcomes that we can get. Um, so, yeah, so I, to, 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 would I work with the Labor government? Yes, if they're going to get us the progress that we need on the things that need to be done. Because um, a bit like the moderates in the Liberal Party, I've, I don't want to be used as a shield for continued inaction in our country. So I think it's important we have the conversations that we need to have to move our country forward. And what was the first question? Distribution Sorry. of preferences. Oh, distribution of preferences. So I actually, and I, um, this conversation excites me because I'm not going to assume that you guys want me to tell you how to lay down your preferences. I actually think it's a really important part of the political process that that decision is yours. And in fact, your preference vote it's almost as important as your number one. So um, what I'm excited about is as the team, we're actually going to do a lot of work in the next four to eight weeks, trying to help people understand the importance of preferences when it comes to the federal level of government, because they are game changers. And just so everybody knows, our current federal member is not in because he won the majority of the vote. He's in because he got the preferences that took him over the line. So um, it's infinitely doable for us to change this seat to be true to ourselves. Um, we just need to be smart about it. And you've got to let John ask his question, Lex. He's been jumping up and down for 40 minutes. Uh, thanks, Kylie. Fantastic <laughs> presentation. John Atkins, my name, and Judy's husband. Uh, we'll be taking a core flute, I think I can say. Um, it's been great hearing from you. Very refreshing. Two things. One, just an observation. When you're talking about uh, North Sydney and channeling history, don't forget Ted Mack. He was an independent and he was a great independent. And the father of independence. And yeah. so I, I, I particularly it appeals to the oldies amongst us, go for that heritage vote. Yeah. So, um, and Ted stood for integrity in, in government. And I'm, I want to play a question to you that gets thrown to me when I'm chatting to friends, oh, but, but where are they getting their money from? You know, how can you really trust this Simon Holmes of Court backed group and where are they getting their money from? It's all very nefarious. And they don't worry about Christian Porter getting a million dollars and we don't know where it is, but There's this no is all very trust. nefarious. I guess two questions. It, it, it's They're in the same theme, so forgive me. But one, what commitments and processes will the Tink campaign put in place to be absolutely absolutely transparent with modern technology it's easy as to where my donation is disclosed um, and then the second is 
what push will you put on? And particularly if you were negotiating for support in a hung parliament, insisting like Andrew Wilkie has done on, on, on really good disclosure of about where the money's coming from and forget about thresholds, where all the money's coming. And you look at the influence, you look at gambling, you look at the influence of the Australian Hotels Association and so on at all levels of government, really driving transparency because i'm all for you i think this is a, a once in a generation opportunity to break the system the vested interests and the money flows that support the current system is critical transparency about that's really important so what's your example what's the example you're going to set and what are you going to push for on those issues yeah and it what a cracker of a question to end on if this is the last one I get asked tonight publicly. I want thank you for asking it. Um, I was recently reading a report from the Centre for Policy Development and literally when I mean recently in the last 24 hours. And what I learned last night was in the last 22 years, the Liberal and Labor parties have collected donations to the value of $1.24 billion dollars billion dollars going in across two parties. 20%, so the top 20% of the donations to both major parties are of gifts of more than a million dollars. So these are single gifts of more than a million dollars going to our two major parties. Um, so from my perspective, actually, and it's kind of cheating a bit because we haven't unveiled the policy yet, but we're going to come back to you guys with a policy that we believe we need to reform money in politics. So the proposal at the moment that we'd like to put forward to the community is that there should be a cap on campaign spending, um, that there should be a reduced cap on donations. I don't know if people know, but at the moment you can donate up to, I think it's $14,500 this year without having to declare it. Um, we're in discussions internally at the moment whether that drops to $1,000 or $200, you know, like where does it come down to? And then real time disclosure. So it's not about nine months after the election. It's literally 24, 48 hours after the money's um, gathered. So I'm all about that reform and incredibly supportive of it. Um, as far as this campaign goes, we've had about a thousand people across the community have made donations to this campaign as it currently stands. And those donations have been right down to two and five dollar amounts and have been as big as $25,000 is the largest donation we've had. Um, I think what is interesting is that at the moment, so Climate 200 exists completely separately to us. I didn't even, I'd never met Simon Holmes at court until I'd already announced as an independent. And then I had a conversation with him. Um, I think what's really important about what Climate 200 is doing is they're actually provoking a conversation around how money is flowing into politics. The way it works for our campaign is that if there's something that we want to do that I know is a significant price, so I, hopefully you guys have seen some billboards that have been out around the electorate in the last kind of few weeks, I went to Climate 200 and asked for that money because as it currently stands, this campaign is being funded by you guys, um, my mortgage and the volunteers that are giving their time. So we have, and I don't want to get this wrong, we have three paid staff in the office at the moment and a couple of consultants working on the outside. So, you know, and we know we will eventually get hammered by the big parties. Um, they won't want to lose this seat. So, you know, we're trying to do everything we can with every dollar that's given. And sorry, I need to address it. I would love to be able to disclose all of the donations that we receive as of right now. And I think what's been really interesting about it, and in fact, when we first launched the campaign, we talked about doing it. And the reason we haven't done it is because there is a very real culture of retribution in our country at the moment. And we've seen it as recently as in Kuyong, where Josh Frydenberg has had access to the names of the donors for Climate 200. So Climate 200 puts up the names of all of their donors. You just don't see the dollar amount they've given. Josh Frydenberg got a list of those donors and started ringing people. 
and telling them that that donation should be withdrawn. How dare they make that donation? And I know Lex and I have had a conversation in the past about retribution in the arts sector when people step up and say something there are you know um consequences of that behavior so at the moment we are playing by the rules that exist to both protect those that are giving to our campaign um but it is absolutely in our policy position going forward to lift the lid on this and say because you know <laughs> i am i'm a white woman living on the lower north shore I'm actually white privileged. You know, this is where I come from. I want to see women and men and people of all backgrounds coming into politics. So I think this particular independent movement is the thin edge of the wedge. You know, we're the first ones going in and then hopefully that opens it up for everybody else. But for that to work, we've got to get money out of politics because it is really hard. I've done a lot of really tough things in my life, but this is really, really hard. And, um, you know, thank goodness I've, I've got my family. My family's got my back and, you know, I've got a mortgage that, you know, keeps paying the electricity bills. <laughs> thank you, Kylie. Um, another point, I, it's probably worth pointing out that I, I noticed a lot of you are not wearing your pink T-shirt tonight. And I assume that's because it's in the wash. Uh, which suggests to me you need a second one. And there's a very attractive merchandising table on the way out, and you can do that there. You can get the cap. I don't know about the bandana. Uh, the bandana's still there or not. Bandanas may have gone. But T-shirts certainly are there. And um, my gosh, and speaking of T-shirts, Carly, one final question. Did you adopt the colour, the campaign colour pink because it rhymes with tink? <laughs> Or is it because after all your years with the McGrath Foundation, you already had a lot of pink clothing? <laughs> so, he, you know, I don't know how many of you, I have this, I have a very strong belief that um, things come into your life at the right time. And what's really fascinating about this story that is me as the front person for this campaign is this pink colour already existed. It was the colour that North Sydney's Independent had adopted, the pink and the blue. It was a two-tone system. So they actually found the tink after they had the pink in this case. And then I guess just me stepping up, um, it has been we've decided to champion the pink colour because, and that does come back actually to my background in the McGrath Foundation because I, a, um, Jane McGrath used to always say it takes a real man to wear pink. So I know men look better in pink. And also I know how important it was when I was at the McGrath Foundation to feel like you were part of something bigger than yourself. And so often people say to me, yeah, but it must be weird seeing your name on a shirt. I can honestly say to you when I look at anyone that's got anything with, I don't see me, I see us. I see Team Tink and I'm really honoured and humbled that you've given me that opportunity. And I'm only, I'm just going to go over the top of Lex here because I'd love you to buy a t-shirt. You're very welcome to buy a t-shirt. But you know what I'd really love you to do? Please go online. Please go online and subscribe to our newsletters. Even better, go online and sign up as a volunteer because here's the, here's the hot tip. If you sign up as a volunteer, you get your t-shirt for free. <laughs> Um, and it's all right by me. Um, please, you know, as I said from the beginning, this is not about me. This is about us. Let's do it. Let's be the difference that this country needs us to be. Oh. And, and while you're on, while you're online, you can check out. We're taking this show on the road. It's um, and we'll be a number of venues over the next few weeks. Uh, no doubt you want to come along. Um, but if you don't, let your friends know that they can come along. They can talk to Carly. They can ask questions. Anything that concerns them about the way North Sydney is run or represented, please come along. Thank you for coming this evening. It's been terrific. And th please thank Carly.
Authorised by Kylie Tink, North Sydney, New South Wales.